Glendora. It is such a joy to introduce you to our upcoming service. That was actually yesterday, which is really exciting. We cannot wait to show you what we did, what was taught, what was sung. So before we go into that, I just really want to welcome you to our table. I want to welcome you to VCG. My name is Ashley. I'm actually the Vineyard Kids Director here at Vineyard Church Glendora, and I want you to know that there's a handful of opportunities for community and connection. And if you have to be on our email list, which trust me, you do, our pastor advocates is literally the best and most encouraging emails. You can email us at info at vineyardglendora.com. And I want to encourage you guys to get connected to one of our reimagination rooms. One hour a week, we've got Sunday at 11, and Sunday at 7, Tuesday at noon. And you guys, I am part of one of the groups, and I love it. I was so fired up after the group. I even texted Pastor Abigail. It's been incredible to hear the heart of our church and the excitement people have to share the good news of Jesus and to love one another rightly. Next Sunday, our worship hub homes meet at Glendora and Laverne, and there's so much of a chance to really connect online and in person, so do sign up for a worship hub home today. There's also opportunities for men and women to gather in fellowship. We've got Men's Girl Night, October 10th at 6.30. We've got Women's Coffee Break, October 17th from 10 to 11.30. And also, you guys, we're going to have some awesome Vineyard Kid and Youth events coming up. So be sure to sign up for notifications in your email. Get connected at the email that I mentioned previously. We also have every Sunday we're connecting on Zoom, doing a fun kids teaching as well. And you can find out more about all of these things on our church website, Facebook, and Instagram pages, which are updated regularly. So as I said in the beginning, our online service is a little bit different this week because we are going to be showing you our in-person service recorded just last night. But within it is just another important step in our journey to reimagine the church. Guys, we're about to worship. Get ready. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So go ahead and just sit back and let the love of God overwhelm you in this moment. Guys, we're so loved. See you soon. Your mercy Thousand generations 
person anymore so let's just let's just stay in this space for a minute and let's just together begin to lift our voices and just proclaim how worthy he is would you pray with me god you are so worthy of all of our praise you are worthy of all of our adoration tonight all of our attention tonight you are worthy lord we join we join the heavenly host in proclaiming, worthy is the lamb of god worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive all glory and all power, and all dominion, Lord, you are worthy. So we stand here tonight, just a couple more generations, with thousands of generations, Lord, that have have all echoed your praises. And we lend our voices tonight to that historical choir of voices who have proclaimed your worthiness and your goodness, no matter what's going on in the world around us. And so be praised tonight, Be exalted tonight. Be worshipped tonight. Through our words, through what we say, through what we do, through how we sing, Lord. Be exalted. Be praised. We bless you. Let's just sing that chorus one more time as we continue on. Be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord, of all. Unto you the slain and raised again. We lift our voice in heaven, singing worthy, Lord, of all. And being thrown upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord of all. Unto you, the slain and risen King, we lift our voice in heaven. You are worthy, 
So Holy Spirit, thank you for your sweet, sweet presence here tonight. Thank you for those who have gathered in this place, those who have come to worship you. And we simply say, receive this, our expression, all we can give. Receive it as our praise tonight. Receive it as part of our worship tonight. We love you. We bless you. And we praise you. And everybody said, amen and amen. Hey, however you can do this in a socially distant, safe way, say hello to somebody, nod, fist bump, elbow bump, uh, pat them on the back. If you haven't seen somebody, some of you haven't seen each other for six months. Some of you, it's your first time with us in six months like this. Say hey to somebody real quick. And there's plenty of seating up front. If you're standing in back, there is plenty of seating up front. All right. Welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us, just getting here, yeah, this is, this is church outside. So thankful to see you in 3D, so thankful to see you in person tonight, and I hope you can see me. We brought in some lights because it's, it's getting darker even earlier now, and so eventually we'll lose daylight savings, but hey, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank Grace Church of Glendora for welcoming us again to this space, Ryland, in the back, who's working from Grace Church, who's working our sound tonight and set everything up for us. Um, man, we could get used to this. Um, just showing up and it's all set up. We're like, we don't know of this. It's just all set up and we just kind of show up and have church. So uh, special thanks to Grace Church and their hospitality. Uh, what a gift they've been. And, and I'm thankful for our children who are here tonight and so thankful. They're doing so well in a really really difficult season, and I'm so thankful that our kids are here tonight, and they have some activities to do, and we actually want to start this evening and start our time together kind of talking to our children. And so kids, I know you have activity pads, and I know you've been given things to do, and some of you are, are like my kids, love to run around, running around and dancing, but if I could have your attention for one minute for the children, I want to start tonight by talking to you. And I just have a few questions, and then I'm going to give you a mission, okay? So be listening, because you will have a mission in a few minutes. So a few questions first. Uh, who's back in school? If you're a child and you are back in school, who's, exci uh, who's excited? Some of you are not children, but you're back in school. Um, who's excited about being back in school? Any kids that you're just excited, even, even if it's online? Uh, some of you homeschool, and so you're like, we're used to this anyway. So well, this is how we roll. Nothing has changed. Uh, but for those of you who are doing online, and I know teachers, I'm not even going to ask you who's excited to be back in school and being online. I um, won't ask that question. Um, so, and tonight, though, kids, I want to talk to you about a word, a real quick word, and it's the word beauty, Beauty, like, you know, Beauty and the Beast. How many, come on, be honest. How many love Beauty and the Beast? I'm talking the animated, not the live action version, but the full old school animated Beauty and the Beast. I want to talk about beauty and the idea of the word beautiful. Um, beautiful is a word. Beauty or beautiful is a word that we use to describe something, right? Or to describe someone or something. We, we might say that there is beauty in that person, or that was, that was really beautiful. We're, we're describing something that's excellent, right? Something that m perhaps moves us, something uh, that is good, something that is awe-inspiring, something that is, like, amazing in some way, right? We, we, would, we might say that that, whatever it is, is beautiful. How many kids you've ever seen? Kids, again, I want to ask you another question. You've ever seen, like, a beautiful sunset? Has anybody ever seen one? Uh, like, maybe even by the beach? where it looks like the sun just kind of like falls right into the ocean, and you're like, where did it go? A beautiful, uh, so, so you, you've seen this, this beautiful sunset. It's amazing, right? And you're like, God, 
that's, that's really good. There, there's this verse in the Bible I want to share with the children real quick, but I hope the adults are paying attention too because this is going to come back for your part here in a minute. In the book of Ecclesiastes, say that with me, kids, Ecclesiastes. There will be a spelling test later and extra credit if you can spell it without looking on your devices, teenagers. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. The writer of Ecclesiastes says these words. He, God, has made everything, guess what the next word is? God has made everything what? Just to, Beautiful, thank you. God has made everything beautiful in its time. And so, here's your mission, children, teens, I don't know, however old you are. If you've got a clipboard in your hand and Miss Kathy gave you a packet of activities, I saw they went all the way up to the middle school. Um, here's what I want you to do somewhere in that packet. Now, preschoolers, first uh, uh, kindergarten and first grade, I think you actually have a page with a picture frame in it. I want you to find that page. And if you're older uh, than if you're like second grade and above, you can use the back of your packet. Or Miss Kathy said, if you go over to the table and you want a picture with a frame in it, like the preschoolers in kindergarten and first grade have, you can go get them. She has a few extras over at the uh, kids' table over there. But here's your mission. Ready? I want you in the next like 15 or 20 minutes. I know you have crayons. I want you to attempt to draw the most beautiful thing you've experienced this year. And I know it's been a rough one. In 2020, I don't know what's been beautiful. No, no, there's been beauty. What is the most beautiful thing you've seen, maybe? Maybe it is a beautiful sunset or a sunrise, or maybe it's someone, even like mom or dad sitting next to you, and you're like, every day I see such beauty in you. I'm just going to draw you, mom. Um, Something beautiful, or maybe it's something beautiful that you've heard, a a bird singing outside your window, a song. Uh, Maybe it's something beautiful that you've smelt. Is that the the, uh, past tense of smelled, smell, smelt? Something, a, a rose, perhaps. You, you smelled something, and you were like, that, is, that smells so wonderful, so beautiful. Or a, a meal, cooking, your favorite meal. Maybe it's something that you've tasted, and it was beautiful. And maybe it was that whatever smelled so good, and you, you then tasted it. Or maybe you're just like, I'm just going to draw chocolate, uh, because that, to me, is, is so wonderful, so beautiful. Or maybe, kids, it's something you've experienced. And you were like, that was just a beautiful moment. A hug from somebody that maybe you haven't been hugged for for a long time or a friend that you haven't seen maybe for a long time. So kids, can you do that for the next like 15 minutes? Like on, on your paper, I want you to draw the most beautiful thing that you've experienced in the last, we'll say, since January this year. All right? So ready, set, draw. Now. While the kids are doing that, and while they are on their mission, adults, parents, I want to talk to us a little bit about ours. And I want to talk to those without clipboards in hand, although I know many of you wish you had them now, right? You're like, can I get on this? I want to draw. I want a clipboard. You want to join this too. I think we have extra clipboards and extra paper over there if you're feeling a little bit left out. Well, speaking of mission... Mission is what we talked about last week on our online service. If you tuned in last week, we are in our week four of a new series that we began this fall, and the whole series is called Church Reimagined. And last week, we spent our entire service reimagining this idea of the mission of God in light of the times that we live in, trying to understand the times in which we live and know what to do. And so we spent an extensive amount of time last week reimagining this idea of the mission of God. I'm so thankful that I think we had, I don't know, over 30 of you sign up to be in one of our reimagination rooms, and that we still have room for more. If you don't even know what that is, you're like, what the heck is a reimagination room? These are three times a week where we come together online, 
tomorrow. There'll be one at 11 a.m. and another one at 7 p.m. tomorrow and then Tuesdays at noon. And it's just a bunch of us that get together for one hour to encourage each other, to inspire each other, and to dream together about what it looks like to pursue the mission of God, the healing, the wholeness, the restoration of our world in our day, in our time, and in a world that we know is very, very broken and is very, very disjointed and is very, very hurting right now. And so I encourage you, if you weren't able to join us last week, get in on one of these because we still have about nine weeks to go. And, And week one, let me tell you, it was good stuff. And it was inspiring stuff to be in those rooms and to hear how you are interacting with what we're talking about and what we're dreaming all together. Well, this evening, we want to turn another corner. And this evening, we want to talk. uh, We believe the next step is just to spend a few minutes talking about reimagining worship. So last week, reimagining the mission, the mission of God. And this week, I want to just spend a few minutes, adults, talking to you and kids. I hope you're listening in as well, talking about reimagining worship. Let's start here. I think a helpful place to start might be with this idea, that the church, not just Vineyard Church Glendora, but I believe all church, all churches, the church, we believe, fundamentally exists as a worshiping community on mission. Now, you can take that line and extrapolate that for many, many weeks and take a big, deep dive into what I said. But the church at its core, what are we about? Why do we exist? We are a worshiping community on mission with God. If we were to, like, narrow it down, I think that's a very helpful definition. And if that's the case, then... There is an intimate and connected relationship between the worship of God and the mission of God. And that's just what we want to begin to reimagine tonight together. What is that relationship? You know, the Bible talks a lot about worship, does it not? Over and over again in the scriptures, from be- literally from beginning to end, the Bible speaks continuously about the worship of God and how it's connected to the mission of God. Let me take you through a few passages real quick to kind of lay that out for you. The very first time the word worship is used in the Bible is Genesis chapter 22. And in, and in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, it says this. I'm taking this totally out of context. I'll set the context back a little bit later. Here's what it says. Genesis 22, 5. I know we don't have a screen behind me and the words won't come up and all that. We actually got to bring our Bibles and pay attention now, don't we? And I have no idea what you're thinking because you're absolutely expressionless, which is one of the other really hard parts about doing it this way. Behind the camera, I don't see you. And now I still, I just see your eyes, so... And I've got a bright light in my eyes here. Genesis 22, verse 5 says this. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Very first time the word worship is used in the Bible. Some guy telling some other guys, he and the boy are going to go over there, do a little worship and then come back. Fast forward in the Bible, you get to the Psalms. The Psalms are filled with the word worship. I mean, I don't have to convince you, hopefully, of this. It's a whole book of worship. And so you get Psalms like Psalm 95, uh, verse 6 says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our Maker. And then you get, fast forward a little bit more, you get to the New Testament. You know what you find in the early church? You find a worshiping community. And and get this, you find that their worship was deeply connected to their mission. If you don't believe me, read Acts chapter 13. In Acts 13, verse 2, it says, while they, they is the first church, they is the early church, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then you get to the very end of the Bible, and what do you find in Revelation? Oh, you just find this picture. You find this vision, do you not? Where John gives us this vision of, of this heavenly realm. And 20, Revelation 4, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. And what do they do? Forever and ever and ceaseless, and they never stop. They what? It says they worship him who lives forever and ever. Point being, from beginning 
to end in this book, in, those, in the scriptures, what we find is that the Bible is filled with the worship of God, and it's filled with a call for the people of God to engage in the worship of God as they're about the mission of God, a church. That's why we exist. And so what I want to do tonight is I, I want to propose tonight that, that maybe... I also don't have my preaching voice because I'm not doing this so often like this. I want to propose that maybe reimagining worship starts here. Maybe it needs to start by enlarging our vision or by expanding our imagination for what we're even talking about when we talk about this curious word, worship. Let's start there. Because I remember being a kid, or a teenager maybe, I was, I was probably in my teenage years, like high school years, and I remember reading Revelation 4, and I remember somebody talking about heaven, and talking about this heavenly realm of ceaseless, endless worship and praise where they never stop singing, and they never stop uh, you know, proclaiming, he is worthy, he is worthy, holy, holy, holy. And I remember uh, hearing this and, and reading Revelation 4, and this vision of this endless, engaged worship experience, and I remember as a teenager thinking, that sounds boring. That sounds a bit monotonous. Anybody with me? I remember reading that and being like, what, what is that? You know what that just shows me now as I think back to that? It, it shows me it only serves to illuminate how narrow and how impoverished a view I had as a teenager of what worship was and what worship was really about. And it also shows me how desperately I needed to reimagine it. And, and have a larger, more expansive vision for what worship truly is. First, let's expand our imagination. And then let me just uh, implore us that, that when it comes to worship, we must expand our, our imagination beyond a fairly narrow understanding, which was me in my teenage years and then some, which basically was this. Worship is singing songs to God, or worship is singing songs about God, either in private or in a gathering like at a church service or concert or somewhere like this, that that's what worship was. Now, saying that, does worship include singing songs? Of course we find that in scriptures. I, I read one of those to you from the Psalms. Of course, we've even done some of that tonight. Does it mean that just because you were singing the songs that you were engaged in worship? No. And so you may have worshipped tonight. I don't know. There was some singing of songs. But it includes that, but that's not, that's not all that worship is. Does, does it go beyond that? Absolutely. It must because it does so in Scripture. You know that first verse I read you about the first time that the word worship is used in Genesis 22, when some guys said to some other guys, I'm going to take the boy, go over there, we are going to worship and then come back. You know what I can guarantee they were not doing over there? Singing songs to God. I'm fairly certain that's not what they meant by worship, was that those two guys are going to go over there, they're going to be a band, they're going to sing some songs, and then they're going to come back. More about that later. And so as we move forward together, I, I want to implore us to swim against an, an understanding, or, 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 or let me say it this way, a cultural Christian tide that often minimizes worship to an event or to singing songs or to an experience or a part of a church service that if we're not careful, can, can very easily slide into what Tom Wright calls a, a self-indulgent religious activity. And let me encourage us tonight to embrace a much, much larger, and I think more compelling, and a, and a, a more holistic understanding of worship. 
and an understanding of worship that doesn't view worship as some optional activity if you choose to join it or not. doesn't see it as like an activity that's kind of tagged on to the Christian experience, but rather has an understanding of worship that sees it as, as living out the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. As a part of a worshiping community on mission. Which brings us right back to our children. How are we doing, kids? What are, how, how are we doing with the drawings? Anybody drawing something? I see some of you are working on some things. Good. Very good. You know, maybe our understanding of worship, maybe our understanding of worship needs to start with beauty. What if we started there? All things beautiful that God has made. Beauty, literally, all around us, wherever we are, if we are just aware of it. Go with me here for a second, because what does beauty do to us? Think about it. What does beauty do to us? It, it enriches our lives, does it not? It, it's like beauty adds color to, to an otherwise kind of monotone living. Beauty, beauty makes us feel more alive. Beauty fills us with awe and, and wonder. <clears throat> and, and, and I think beauty makes us more humble. Here's why. I, I think beauty elicits humility simply because when you're looking at a beautiful sunset, at that very moment you realize there is nothing you did to cause it. And there's nothing you did to earn it. It just is. It's just beautiful. It just happened to you. Now, take that a step further. Go with me another step then. And let me ask this question. What then does beauty call out of us? I I said what it does to us. It inspires us. It fills us with a sense of awe and wonder. It makes us feel alive. It enriches us. It, it leaves us, us, us. But then what does it then call out of us? I would dare say tonight, when I stand before a beautiful sunset and it elicits that in me, it calls out of me gratitude, does it not? Gratitude. I stand there and I, at the shore of the ocean, it's like, thank you. Why is that? Delight. It just happened. And it's going to happen again tomorrow, same time, maybe a few minutes before. It elicits a response of delight, of gratitude, a sense of awe and wonder. And maybe, and I would say, not even a maybe, it does this. It elicits a longing for something that's beyond it. We're not longing for the sunset when we see its beauty There is something hardwired within us that longs for the something beyond the beautiful sunset. Do you know what I mean? And if you don't, go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and read the rest of verse 11. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. You know what the very next line of that is? He has also set eternity in the human heart. What is that? It's a longing. For something that's eternal, for for something more. So what we're really talking about here is a response. And if we allow ourselves to have that response over and over again, not just at a service like this, not just at a time of singing, but if we allow ourselves to have that response standing on the beach or, or or, or listening to the song that just moved us in some way or having that good meal together with friends, if we allow ourselves to have that response of gratitude and delight and a sense of awe and wonder, you know where that will eventually lead us to? Worship. It has to. It's the way we were created. It it leads us right to worship. And if we follow that even further, you know where that leads? Then it ultimately culminates in the worship of God. The one who made all things beautiful in their time. And so I want to suggest tonight simply this. To our kids who are hopefully drawing something beautiful and to the adults here to tonight, I, I want to suggest that our ordinary 
everyday experiences of beauty are given to us as clues, as like starting points, as, as signposts to help us see and to help us become aware and to help us recognize and to help us glimpse and then to help us worship the beauty that is God himself. And if that is the case, then maybe, maybe one of the central tasks of the church as a worshiping community on mission, maybe one of our central tasks then is to help point out all of the goodness and all of the beauty to a world that is worn out and that is warped and that is weary and that is monotone and that is broken. We point it out to help people see it, to help people become aware of it, maybe because we're living it. There is something beautiful about the way you and I have chosen to live and to love. And so a broken and hurting world is like, what's the thing behind the thing? Tell me, what's, the, what, what's behind the sunset? For you see, the Bible suggests that that worship is not just what the Christian was created for. Worship is, in fact, what the cosmos were created for. It's what all creation was created for. Why do the birds sing? Why do the flowers bloom with the sense that they have? Why does a newborn baby giggle and laugh? Why all these things? I mean, I'm asking those simple questions, but I hope you can see where this is all going because it was all created to, to bring glory and worship. Why do the oceans roar? The truth is there is an eternal longing. There is a sense of otherness in every human heart. And if that's the case, then pointing people to the worship of God is the central task of the church on its mission. It's like we become the signposts. We are the signposts pointing people. This is this to invite everyone everywhere to follow the signpost, to recognize why the, be- why the sunset, the beautiful sunset moves us the way it does and why the scent of the flower in their garden moved them and why that song at that time that was so beautiful moved them to tears to help connect the dots and to accept an entirely new way of living and an entirely new way of being in the world. I think this is the beginning of reimagining worship. Are you with me? I can't see your faces. There's light shining in my eyes and you're all wearing masks. I believe this is the beginning of reimagining worship. And I believe it's what our, our weary, broken world, I believe it's what it needs now, now more than ever. Rainer, you guys can go ahead and, and come on up and get in place. You know, in a, in, a, in a world that is severely lacking in beauty and imagination right now, when it comes to our politics, we lack a lot of imagination and a lot of beauty. When it, when it comes to our economics, we... When it comes to our educational systems, when it comes to healthcare, when it when it comes to race race relations, we could just go down the list, couldn't we? And we could say we lack a lot of beauty and a lot of imagination. I propose tonight that what the world needs is not simply to be invited to an event to sing songs about or to God. But what our world needs is a worshiping community that is pouring their lives out in beautiful acts of love and compassion for the restoration and the healing of the world and that are helping people to connect the dots and to see the thing behind the thing and to come to know this beautiful God that we have come to know. And so here's what I want to challenge this week. Kids, if you have drawn something beautiful tonight, would you do this? Here's what I want you to do, because our world needs more beauty, and our world needs more imagination. I want you to pray, and I want you to ask God, who should I give this to? Somebody that's not here. Let's make those the rules. They could not be here tonight. But I want you to give your drawing to someone that God lays on your heart. And when you give them your drawing of something beautiful that that you have created, I want you to tell that person, you know what? I was inspired by this beauty. 
that God has made. And so I drew you this picture. And hopefully it will encourage you. And hopefully it will inspire you. And hopefully that you will know that you are loved too. Can you do that, kids? If you've drawn something, just give it to somebody. Give it away to somebody else. And and the rest of us this week, I want to challenge us to, to look look for ways to point people to worship this week. Look for ways to reimagine what your worship might look like this week by pouring your life out in beautiful acts of care and compassion and love like so many of you do, I know, day in and day out. But let's ask the Lord for more. The first verse I read tonight about that first mention of worship came from Genesis 22. And that man and that boy, that was Abraham and Isaac, wasn't it? And what were they going to go over there and do when they were going to go over and worship and then come back? Like I said, there was no band waiting for them to sing a closing song. What they were going to go over and do involved taking an animal and sacrificing it on an altar, right? And you know where the story went. Like, (laughs) Isaac was the animal, right? I mean, that was what's not said in the story. Like, that's what they were going to do. That was the, the worship. The, the worship involved the sacrifice. And, and, then, and then we read in the New Testament, and we read Paul. And in, and in Romans chapter 12, I'll close with this. Listen to the way Paul describes worship to the early church. Romans 12. Therefore, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as what? Living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And then he says, this is your true and proper, what? Worship. That's what Paul says. Paul says, you want to know what your true and proper worship is? Does it have to do with singing? Oh, sure. But you know what it really is? It's putting yourself up on that altar. Your dreams, your plans, your resources, your money, your time, your energy, your future. It's putting yourself on the altar. Paul goes as extreme as he can. And I'll end with this. I think this is the call for the church today. In 2020, as we move forward, the church is a group of people who are committed to offering all of themselves as living sacrifices for the sake of the healing and the salvation and the restoration of all things. That's just what we do. That's our worship. That's what we were, we were created to fo- for. And I cannot wait to get to those reimagination rooms tomorrow and on Tuesday to hear what God, the dreams and the visions and what God's putting in your hearts as we live this out together. Let's stand together. You are going to have the opportunity now to give a sacrifice of praise, which is your voice. And Rainier's going to lead us in that, and then Abigail's going to come up and lead us through our communion time, and we'll end with prayer. But let's just, uh, let's just focus our hearts in as we prepare for communion. Guys, thank you so much for joining our service today. I hope you enjoyed watching, and we're encouraged in this time. We just want to really, really encourage you to click on our prayer button. There are people ready and excited to pray with you however you come to the chat today. And just remember, you're not alone. And while times are extremely challenging, that hard stuff seems to happen left and right, that at the center, God is good and is with us. Wonderful rest of your Sunday. Grace and peace.